Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome and thanks for logging on. We're doing three videos this weekend for the U.S. Labor Day holiday and everything is for sale. Reach out to me, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. These watches are in stock at the time the video airs, but they are going fast. Be the first to reach out to tmasso at thewatchbox.com to buy or sell us a watch, trade us a watch. We buy what we sell, we sell what we buy. We are always looking to build inventory. One watch for an entire collection, no upper limit on value paid. We pay cash, we pay fast. We make the process as easy as clicking a button. To buy, trade, or sell, reach out to me directly. I am T Mosso at thewatchbox.com. First up, we've got a lovely cherry red dial, white gold, 36 millimeter Rolex day date. This is a dial you can almost taste undertones of red, a little bit of burgundy in there, and it's a surprisingly sporty take on the day date with a fully luminescent dial. It's also 100 meters water resistant, shock resistant, robustly anti-magnetic. This watch has all of the ingredients for your daily driver. At Rolex, traditionally, 36 millimeters was a men's case size, but today it's really a unisex option as 36 wears well on just about any wrist. You can see this is a sporty take on a day date because not only is it loomed, but instead of the president bracelet, we have the sportier three-link oyster design. But we still have the crown clasp, that little hidden partition point, popping it open. You can see this watch is gray gold, which is white gold that never needs to be rhodium plated. Throwing it on the wrist, my wrist is 16 centimeters in circumference. It wears nicely, comfortably flat. The fluted bezel reminding us this is precious metal Rolex. And you can see the lugs nowhere near the edges of my wrist. It is a double quick set, which means you have a system that allows you to rapidly cycle the day as well as the date. And of course, hacking seconds, chronometer certified, 48 hour power reserve, Rolex manufacturer inside and out. Rolex has its own foundry, it smelts its own golds, so it makes the cases, the clasps, the bracelets all. And again, this is gray gold, an 18 karat white gold that never needs to be plated. An awesome take on the traditional day date. Now here's a watch whose apocryphal history dates back to the 1930s and whose actual history is a highlight of the 1980s. Now it's often said that Cartier built some sort of canteen crown water resistant watch for the Pasha of Marrakesh in the 30s. Even I used to believe it was true and who knows, maybe it is. But the Pasha as we know it today was a 1985 design by Gerald Genta who took a number of antiquarian ideas and incorporated them into a modern luxury watch. So we have these hinged Vendome style lugs we have a sapphire cabochon on a canteen cap atop the actual crown used to wind and set the watch. We have this distinctive flange profile to a monoblock case, so bezel and case are all one piece. Everything loads through the back. The 85 Pasha gave way to this watch, the late 80s Pasha Perpetual Calendar. This is the Pasha de Cartier Perpetual. It is a mechanical Gerald Genta Perpetual Calendar which means Gerald Genta, the brand out of Le Sentier, designed this perpetual calendar moon phase module for Cartier. The base caliber that drives it is a Jaeger Le Coult 889. So we've got the best of everything here in this 38 millimeter vintage yellow gold case. We've got a Gerald Genta design with the Cartier name, a Gerald Genta complication module, and a JLC base movement. This is a special watch. It uses a version of the famous Louis Cartier 1909 deployant clasp, which was the very first deployant clasp designed for a wristwatch. You can see the strap is seamless with no punctures because this uses a crimping system for infinite adjustability that you don't get when you're using a punctured or perforated strap. It's a really cool watch. It's only 44.5 millimeters from lug to lug. And though the strap is fresh and thus quite stiff, I'll throw it on my wrist and get a good sense of how it fits. It fits nicely. And I could recommend it on a male or female wrist because of the late 80s sizing. Although 38 wears more like a 36 or a 35, and it is, it is quite thin, as you can see in profile. A Gerald Genta complication module with a JLC base and a Cartier case. What a machine. The 90s were an interesting time. Following the 80s that birthed that Cartier, Franck Muller rose to fame as the original success story in the independent horology scene. And a lot of times the Franck Muller watches incorporated sensible base calibers built up with complications in the brand's then signature tonneau case profile. So you can see here in white gold, we have the Biretro 
perpetual calendar. And this is a rare Franck Muller that really does include complications. Taking a look at the dial side, by the way, you can see the case back, still deep engravings. We have a dial with retrograding day, retrograding date. It is a perpetual calendar with moon phase, and it is also a chronograph. Now, the base caliber here is a tried and true Valjoux 7750, and then the module is either Dubois de Praz or possibly Agenor, as a very similar calendar system with by retrogrades was developed by Roger Dubuis and Jean Marc Viderest of Agenor for the original Harry Winston High Horology watch in 1989, the Accenture Perpetual Calendar. Later, Dubuis would use a version of that chronograph and perpetual calendar retrograde system on his own watches. So this may actually be the Agenor module developed by Dubuis and Viderest back in the late 80s. In either case, it is an automatic winding perpetual calendar chronograph with moon phase and retrogrades in white gold. It's a stunner. On my wrist, you can see how the tonneau case wears. It's large, but not so in charge that I can't pull it off. It's not quite over the edge of my wrist. I would say I'm borderline for this one. So if your wrist is my size, it's gonna fit securely. If you want to ensure the aesthetics are perfect, then 17 centimeters circumference wrist and up a little bit bigger than mine. Alanka Unzona is known for quality, and frankly, Langa has always impressed me with its consistency. I don't think the company has ever made an ugly watch or an ugly movement. What we have here is the second generation Langa One Time Zone as updated for 2020. The original came out in 2005. This actually keeps the size of the original, which is also the original Grand Langa One case size. Pardon me, this one's actually 41. And you can see that it is in white gold, fairly thin in profile, with a sterling silver dial that has been blackened. And so we have a second time zone that's sort of, I would say this watch is sort of straddling the fence between a dual time and a world time. Now you see how I can set both time zones in sync. And then I have a little AM PM indicator that clarifies whether I am looking at day or night on each of these dials. Now, take a quick look, because there's a little adjuster that allows me to change the city of reference. There's a little index next to that second time zone that shows your city of reference for that travel time, that remote time zone, that place where you are not. So let's say I want to go from Dubai to Bangkok. It does all the math for me. You can also see that if you want to make a change, to decouple the two, the way this works is you actually hold the jumper button and you adjust the hours backwards. That's how you decouple these two. Now we've got a double digit date, the panorama datum. We do have a little trigger that allows you to index that. And then the watch features a, a solid sterling silver dial base, white gold date frame, hands, indices, and numerals. And then on the reverse side, we have a movement with two spectacular bridges, half bridges really. One for the mechanism that underpins the travel time with pocket watch style wheels. And then the other holds the balance cock. And both of these are freehand engraved in German silver, which is this nickel copper zinc alloy that's used with the copper giving it the golden hue. We have stripes. We have mirrored unglage. You can see not just on the edge of the bridges, but also on the edge of the access port for service at center. The stripes are broad, light, and luminous. You can see that they have a gradient dark on one side, light on the other. That's how you know that they were laid down by abrasive roller rather than stamped. There's engine turning on the base plate. You can see that we have black polish on the cap for the escape wheel, the swan's neck, the case clamp screws, some of the other fixing screws, such as on the swan's neck and on the center panel. Then we also have fired blued screws and a couple of golden chiton cups fixed by screws, reminding us that's how jewels were often set in the pocket watch era. To that end, we have an homage to the pocket watch era in the form of this giant three-quarter style bridge. And again, 41 millimeters, a watch that wears quite nicely. Again, it's the size of a Grand Longa one. And it's flat, so though it's big, it's also flush, and it'll fit underneath the cuff. This one being white gold with a black dial, it's one of the sportier versions of the Longa one uh, time zone. So I really feel like this one can be worn just as easily with short sleeves as with long. 
Still speaking German, but this time in German Switzerland, we travel to Schaffhausen, where H. Moser and C. has been since 2012 a success story. Now, previously, from 2005, when the firm was re-established with its historic name, it struggled for its first couple of years. The Melan family, which has historic ties to Audemars Piguet, purchased Moser in 2012, and really, it's been on a winning streak ever since. But this is an older-style case from the prior regime with subsequent Moser watchmaking included. What you're looking at here is an uncommon material. Look at the buckle. You can see it says PD950. This is actually palladium. So precious metal palladium is something you rarely see on luxury watches. It's something that's been used occasionally by Parmigiani, Ulysse Nardin, a few others. This is a very unusual watch. It feels like precious metal, and it is precious metal, and it is hallmarked, but it's not gold and it's not platinum. You can see, though, it's as white as platinum. It's much whiter than white gold. The case is sculpted with beautiful concaves, mirror-polished, satination at the mid-case. We have a concave bezel profile, a sharply knurled crown. We have a fume fade dial with a sort of fade from silver to anthracite. And unlike a lot of Moser dials, which can sometimes be difficult to read without indices, this one has them. You can also see, this is the old-style Moser movement, and it has twin barrels. It's the caliber 343, seven day rated power reserve. In fact, it will run for almost nine. And you can see it is a complication with the power reserve indicator hidden on the case back. On the dial side, we have hacking or stop seconds, but only three hands and no date. The power reserve indicator for the twin mainspring barrels in series is hidden right here. The escapement is in-house, hairspring, lever, wheel, balance staff, and balance, all made by Moser's Precision Engineering subsidiary with a solid gold escapement to reduce friction. And we have two flat hairsprings, 180 degrees opposed. This is only used on very special Moser watches, generally only on tourbillon. So to see it here on a watch that is not a tourbillon and a palladium case, this is a very rare piece. Having two flat hairsprings, 180 degrees out of phase, means that in any position where one is caused by gravity to run faster, the other by an equal and opposite margin will cause the balance to beat slower. So in any position, it instantaneously cancels out the effects of gravity. Now we've also got six position adjustment, which is one more than a standard chronometer. So this is an exacting sort of adjustment with no place for imprecision to hide. Five position adjusted chronometers, watchmakers can find a way to hide all of the time gained or time lost in one unadjusted position with six positions. That is dial up, dial down, crown up, crown down, crown right, crown left the watch has to run perfectly in every orientation. And again, this is a seven to nine day power reserve, double hairspring palladium dress watch from Moser, a really special piece for a wrist of 15 centimeters circumference or larger. This watch is 40.8 millimeters in diameter for scale. Okay, Romain Gautier also started in the mid-2000s when Moser was getting back on its feet, but Gautier out of the gate knew what he was doing, whereas the people who founded the modern Moser wasted a lot of money with a catastrophically inefficient physical plant and business plan. Romain Gautier is both an MBA, a Master of Business Administration, and an engineer, and hailing from the Vallée du Jeu, the watchmaking part that he didn't know firsthand, he copied from the best. Learning, not copying, from the likes of Philippe Dufour and others, he created beautiful watches at a brand that built in its early years only a few dozen pieces per year. In the finest tradition of the Valet du Jeu, we have the Romain Gautier HM, the first model built by the company, Heure Minute, or Hour and Minute. The watch is simple, and yet it's not. You can see how the case features this dramatic combination of both convex and concave profiling. You can see that the lugs have this wonderful dished hollow to them, and then they're welded onto the case with evidence of the weld removed by hand to create an excruciatingly hand-finished, slow-going process that manually yields this case. 
Because he is an engineer, he thought about doing things differently. Note how there's no crown. It hides on the case back. Like the Omega Central Tourbillon, you have a crown that can be used for setting. You simply pull it up, and having done so, it allows you to set the watch. Push it back down, and you can see it has a serration on its side that makes it easy to grip. You also use it to wind the watch, just like that. Now the watch has a guilloche dial of extraordinary pattern. This isn't some rosette, fish scale, or wave. It's a sort of modified barley corn. The center dial has a sunburst, the hands are white gold, and then we have this raised track for the anthracite hour track and radially arrayed Roman numerals, including a watchmaker's four, with another track much like it outboard to echo. And on the case back, we have the movement, which is the 2206 HM. Manual wind with a 60 hour power reserve. You can see this is cost no object finishing. These stripes are extraordinary. You don't get a gradient and texture like that, even from conventional uh, roller rubbing. Like an abrasive wheel across a movement will give you high grade Cote de Genève, this is slow going with a specially built drum. You can also see that the anglage is a mile wide. It requires thicker bridges in order to get these broader bevels, but this is the way Philippe Dufour does it, drawing the bevel deeply across the bridge. We also have sharp and super deep interior angles where bevels meet, as good as anything in the world, in fact, better than almost anything in the world. We have black polish. Look at the cap to this escape wheel cover. Look at this click. Look at the engine turning and how tightly spaced and evenly spaced it is on the base plate. With freehand engraved individual numbering, this is number 14 out of 38 made in this style. Romain Gautier from the early days making small parts like his own free-sprung balance wheel and his own train wheels, which have circle and circle design. Frankly, folks, this is as good as it gets. At 41 millimeters, it is large, though, for a two-hand watch. So I'll show it on my wrist, and you can see it is quite broad. It takes up a lot of wrist real estate, which is why I'm actually going to recommend this for watches or for wrists my size or larger. So 16 centimeters circumference or larger. That's what it really takes to wear this watch. 41 millimeters, but you really need to think of it as like a 42 or a 43. That said, it is reasonably thin. Now, if that's not the ultimate watch in this episode, what is? Let's see if you can guess. Do you know what this is? only 4.3 millimeters thick and so thin that in 2017 it was the world's thinnest automatic watch. This is the Piaget Alteplano Ultimate. Now, 41 millimeters in diameter in white gold. It has a retail price of over $35,000. So this is true high horology. But you're asking, how is it an automatic watch? Well, look, see this little 910P? That's the name of the movement. See how it moves and rocks back and forth? It sits on ceramic bearings, and it is a peripheral rotor. Up at the top, right about one o'clock, we have a ceramic bearing borne winding system that converts the motion of this peripheral rotor into a 48 to 50 hour power reserve that is damn impressive given how thin the watch is. We have a pretty visible train from a barrel that sits on ball bearings rather than a jewel pivot, skeletonization so you can see the drivetrain down to the escapement, and then we have a balance adjacent to a dial that is actually sunken below the bridges, and there's a reason for that. The crystal is one-fifth of a millimeter thick, so if you apply too much pressure, it can flex a little bit. By sinking the hands in the dial below the plane of the bridges, if the crystal flexes, it'll come in contact with the bridges before the hands, and therefore will not stop the watch. Now, to get the watch this thin, unusual measures were taken. First, you could see that some of these components are held in place using screws that are fixed into the case laterally. So some of these bridges are fixed using lateral assembly screws. The base plate of the movement is also the case back of the watch. So on one side, you have the coat of arms, the name, the notation of automatic winding, and the hallmarks. But on the other side of this piece of white gold, you have set gems, 
you have wheel pivots. This is the movement. It's just the outward facing side of the movement. And it's got a surprisingly broad spacing between the lugs of about 21 millimeters. It is a marvel of engineering and deeply impressive. There's no doubt that at $35,000, Piaget was not making a ton of money on these. Nothing wears thinner, at least nothing short of a Richard Mill UP1, the Octo Finissimo Ultimate from Bulgari, and Piaget's own Altiplano Ultimate concept. This is the Altiplano Ultimate. 4.3 millimeters thick. You can see just how ridiculously thin it is, but also that it's fairly short across the wrist at about, I believe it's about 45 to 46 millimeters. So a small wrist, even as small as 14 centimeters circumference can wear this 45 or 41 millimeter white gold watch. And you can just see how otherworldly the thinness is. This really is the coolest watch I have on the table today. A one-time record holder still awe-inspiring from a brand that doesn't get enough credit for how much it accomplishes in terms of innovation and also manufacture watchmaking. Remember, Piaget has been making its own manufacture ultra-thin movements since 1957. Reach out to me. I am tmasso at thewatchbox.com for purchase and pricing details.